those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Stephanie Selinski. I'm the Associate Director of Applied Research and Development at the Yuma Center of Excellence for Desert Agriculture. I haven't figured out who gave me that title exactly, but they're trying to kill me. Um, so thanks for coming. And I, when I was planning this symposium, I wanted to just cram as much as possible in here and get as much information out to you, get as many people on the stage that um, you can hear from. And one way we're, the, we're doing that is with these lightning sessions. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction to our, our four speakers and then just let them come up on their own and give their single slide five minute talks. Um, our first speaker is Dia Alshika, and he is a new irrigation specialist. He's located, an assistant professor. He's located in Maricopa. We have Glenn Wright, who's an extension horticulturalist, and he is located in Yuma. Samuel Disqua is a postdoc with um, John Palumbo, and he's located in Yuma. And Matt Halderson is the director in Ag and Natural Resource Agent in Yavapai County. And I picked these four people to be in this session because they are all off main campus. So this is an opportunity to hear from some people that um, you don't see on main campus as often as you would probably like to. So our first speaker is Dia. Hi, my name is Dia Al-Sheikha. Uh, I'm an irrigation specialist with the University of Arizona. And I have been in this position for the past three months. So I am new. Uh, today we'll talk about uh, an irrigation extension program that we'll have in 2023. Uh, the program is supposed to help with uh, reduce uh, water use for uh, crops grown in Arizona by promoting like different irrigation systems, like for example the gravity drip irrigation system, which is a uh, drip system that doesn't require pumping. Um, also uh, promoting the Mobile drip. Mobile drip is like a, a linear uh, move system or center pivot, but instead of having sprinklers, you would use drip tapes like this one. Uh, so this way you can apply water near the ground. You can avoid like uh, disease associated with the other sprinkler, the regular sprinkler systems. Uh, also, we'll uh, we'll try to give an introduction about the other systems that can that have like. Um, uh, low water use and low energy use. Um, just wanted to mention that when I first started, I started to talk to farmers about new irrigation systems. And specifically in Yuma, I have discovered that they have very efficient flood irrigation systems. They have reached an irrigation efficiency above 85%. So for these systems, they are really good for now. I don't advise that they should move to the new system. However, the achievements they have done are based on the availability of water and the high flow rates, which may not be available in the future. That's why I believe it's time for us to start investigating new systems, like you know, a specifying section in their field where they test these systems, see the problems, and try to solve them. I'm sure with our science and their expertise, we'll able to uh, solve any, any issues that we may have with these new systems. Also, we'll, uh, the program will involve uh, remote sensing. They use remote sensing, whether it's from satellites or drones, uh, to determine uh, water use for different crops. Also, we'll talk about different sensors. Like, there are tons of sensors, like soil moisture sensors, available now on the market. And they, are, they may not be calibrated, so we'll try to calibrate some of these sensors. Some of them don't give you only like soil moisture content, but also they give you some information. For example, this one about uh, salinity in the soil, about also uh, like uh, root depths. We have an algorithm to give you like estimation of your root depths. Um, also, we'll talk about irrigation scheduling models. You know, when I say models, some growers may think, you know, we don't want like more complications. However, some of them are really simple, as simple as an application on your phone, where you give it some information when you irrigated last time, how much was the amount and the soil time and stuff like that. You insert one time. Dr. Peter Waller from the University of Arizona have a model called WINS, and he's working on developing it into uh, an app on your phone. Uh, so we'll try to educate farmers about uh, models like this. 
And uh, we'll talk about also new crops. We have something called Wayuli. It's a desert shrub used to produce rubber. We have uh, been doing irrigation experiments for the past 10 years on, on Wayuli. It's very efficient crop. You can apply water when available. When it's not available for a month to three months, it's okay, it will survive until you have water available to continue. So it will continue its growth, it will not die. Uh, we'll have lots of activities. We'll, we'll be able to monitor. So we have some farmers already signed for this program that we'll have in 2023. So we'll go to the farms. We'll get involved with them. Uh, we'll have uh, monitoring for the crops from planting until uh, they are harvested. We'll have hands-on training. We'll have workshops. And we'll have also like field days to display the information that we got from this project. Uh, if you are interested in participating, please let us know and we can include you. And I wanted to let you know, I am located at uh, Maricopa Agriculture Center, but my job is to collaborate with farmers everywhere in Arizona. So if you need me for anything related to irrigation, please let me know and I will come to you. Thank you very much. Well, unlike the previous speaker, I've been here for 30 years. And uh, I guess maybe now it's a bit time for something different. I work with citrus and date palms, and I kind of put together a laundry list of all the stuff that I've done over the various 30 years. And like Robert Masson, I'm ra a rather bit of a generalist. I've learned to understand nematodes some. I didn't have any, don't have any training in that, but you know, the, the work has to be done. I do quite a bit of, uh, of some of the contract uh, uh, research like uh, Robert talks about. So the green in there in the list is what I'm doing now and uh, the yellow is what I've done in the past and then there's some stuff down at the bottom that's white. So I wanted to highlight just a couple things that maybe you're not aware of. So I've done quite a bit of uh, varietal and rootstock evaluation and acquisition um, over the years and one thing I would say in comment to some of the previous uh, in to some of the previous comments is you don't want to stop looking for ideas just in the region, okay? You want to go and get some ideas from the rest of the United States or maybe from the rest of the world because some of the new lemon varieties that we're planting now in the desert are from Spain, okay? And I just got back last night from Turkey and they got one, they got a good lemon variety down there that we're going to bring in. It's, a, it's really got a smooth peel, some of the things that we're looking for and it, it, and it uh, can be uh, seedless. Um, got a lot of cooperative trials with the University of California. The uh, desert uh, citrus industry doesn't stop at the river. We've got uh, 15 trials in the ground in California that I cooperate with, and a lot of those lemons that we're dealing with are seedless ones because that's the new innovation in, uh, in lemon growing. Another thing that I do is the National Clean Plant Network. If you want a piece of virus-free budwood, we can offer it to you. Um, that's important to stop uh, plant disease. Um, some of the other things that I deal with is uh, brown heartwood rot, which is the biggest issue that we have in Arizona citrus growing right now. I've got a, a, quite a number of grants on that. Um, and like I mentioned, some nematicide trials with, both, uh, with a couple of different agricultural um, chemical firms. Uh, date palms. So when I was hired in 1992, date palms were not much of an industry and they have gone from about um, 1,000 acres to about 7,000 acres here in Yuma County and so I've tried to uh, to kind of pivot or add to what my add to what I did done before and we have worked with fruit thinning which is an important thing, fruit sizing, uh, water use, we have some probes in some, in some uh, date palms right now to estimate water use. Date uh, uh, probes in a monocot are uh, quite a bit more um, complicated than they are in a die, die cot. We have variety acquisition. I have about 25 different kinds of dates at the university farm, most of which you probably never even tried before. And I've got a project in Oman. Uh, which is a whole nother issue. On top of that, uh, I do extension. Robert helps me a lot now with the, uh, with the meetings that we do. Uh, I do teach. I've been teaching in the program that, ta that Tanya just mentioned. I guess I was one of the originals. Uh, started in 1995. 
and master gardeners. If you're not familiar with the master gardeners, the master gardeners are the people that keep me from having to answer the entire population of the state of Arizona the same question, which is, why does my citrus tree look so bad? So I find that if I train the master gardeners, they can help answer the, some of these questions. And it's always important to remember that as much research as we do here for the industry, and as much work as we do, oftentimes it's the Master Gardener program and the 4-H program that are the, um, the gateways for your average Arizonan to understand what the university does, um, other than, of course, the, bill, the tuition bill that comes in the mail. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Samuel Disqua, and uh, I'm a postdoc at Dr. Palumbo's lab. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, so I'll be talking on his behalf. Um, the Vegetable Crops IPM program um, is chaired by Dr. Palumbo. He is uh, the endowed chair of Integrated Pest Management, and this endowed chair was created by the growers and the ag industry leaders that support the work that he does. Uh, Dr. Palumbo has established uh, an applied research program that investigates biology, ecology, and management of insect pests associated with leafy greens and melons. And the bulk of the work that happens in this lab is insecticide efficacy trials. So we work and we do about 50 different uh, insecticide efficacy trials every year. We work with uh, registered products and also number compounds. And uh, this research, um, it's very important for the industry. The work that Dr. Palumbo does is considered uh, the standard for, the gold standard for um, insecticide leafy greens uh, work. And as a matter of fact, he couldn't be here today because he is at the entomology meeting presenting um, about some work that he's done in early development of espinosins, which is a, is a group of insecticides that has been revolutionary and very widely used um, in leafy greens production. So you can see in the, in the image that I have in there uh, on the left that says relatively, relative insecticide efficacy just shows how many trials have been done just studying that pest, the thrips, and looking at what products work and what's the relative efficacy of that product. So these guides that are developed from this testing are widely used by pest control advisors. Many pest control advisors reach out to John uh, for questions about uh, different pests and what products uh, to use. Um, in addition to the efficacy trials, we have a, a pest monitoring program where we have a, a series of traps along the Yuma Valley where we sample insects and, and we get relative trends on the populations on how many insects uh, or how the populations change year over year to get some trends and use that as an early warning, sy warning system to advise PCAs on the numbers of that pest that we're seeing. We also survey the growers and the PCAs on their insecticide use to get ideas on um, what products are being used, how many sprays are being done on, on, on different leafy greens and crops. And um, throughout the years, uh, in over 30 years, Dr. Palumbo has also being at the forefront on tackling different challenges uh, to the leafy green industry. So you heard earlier from um, Mr. Bobby Barkley about the Bagrata bug. That was one of the pests in the 20, 2010s that uh, was a problem and he did some of the studies on how to control it, uh, looking at the biology and, 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 and ecology of that pest. Uh, more recently, we're working with impatient necrotic spot virus, which uh, it's, it's a big threat to the lettuce industry. In Salinas, it's one of the major problems in Salinas, and we're just studying and trying to determine if it's going to become a, a big problem here and, and what would be the consequences of INSV. And um, there's a lot more work uh, that, that John has done, and, and, and the important thing is that he has developed very good relationships with industry, with pest control advisors, and he's built that trust with them so that they uh, reach out to him. And uh, uh, the work that he's done is, is invaluable to the industry. Um, I don't have much more time to um, mention about some of the projects. I have a, a couple of posters talking about our current INSV research, as well as uh, an overview of what Dr. Palumba does uh, for his lab. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon, folks. My name is Matt Halderson, and I am the director of uh, Cooperative Extension in Yavapai County. I'm also the Ag and Natural Resources agent in Yavapai County. Um, but listening to all these folks, I sort of feel like, like the love child of, of industry and academics. Nothing, okay. So uh, the reason is, <laughs> the reason I say that is because uh, if, if Dr. Rock would have asked her question, I don't know, six months ago, who's part of industry and who's part of academics, six months ago I would have raised my hand that I was a part of industry because I've spent the last decade working in the, in the Washington State wine grape industry. So. Uh, Working extension now, I feel like that gives me a, a lot of uh, opportunities to, to understand and empathize with what's going on with, with industry reps. And at the same time, uh, because I haven't been doing a lot of public speaking in academia, um, it, it, can be, it, it can be a little bit of a hamstring. I don't know if you guys have ever bombed at the Camp Verde Public Library, but it's, uh, it's a rough one, I'll tell you. So, um, so because of my experience in uh, in viticulture and growing wine grapes. I, I really believe that wine grapes are a great product for the state of Arizona right now. Uh, when we're talking about acre feet of, of water use, my experience shows that we're using 1.5 acre feet, which is a huge reduction compared to a lot of other crops. I don't know how well wine grapes work in the Yuma area. It might be a touch hot. I, when I was farming last year, it was hitting 115 degrees at times, so it's not unheard of. Uh, but for sustained periods, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but I think there's plenty of room in the state of Arizona. So uh, because I'm coming from industry uh, and, you know, I went to graduate school and now I'm back in, in academia, I really feel like I understand how powerful these collaborations can be. What I saw in Washington State, and that's what I'll talk, to, talk about most uh, of the time today here, is my experience and my viewpoint because that's what I've got. Uh, but when I was in Washington State, I saw uh, collaborations between industry and academia as a very strong piece, and I saw that when you have strong academics, you have strong industry and, and vice versa. But what I also knew, especially in grad school, is that sometimes it's a little bit difficult if you're not a grower, if you're not a producer, if you don't live that day-to-day -day life, uh, it's hard to know maybe what industry really needs. Uh, I was, I was uh, intimidated by that as a graduate student and that's one of the reasons I stuck around and worked in industry for so long was that so that when I was given the opportunity to come back to Arizona to serve, I would understand the wine grape industry and be able to help them out. So, um, you know, in my opinion, it is the role of, of academia to support stakeholders. In this case, we're talking about growers and, uh, and, and allow them to not worry so much about trying to, trying to reinvent wheels, but letting academics do that. And when it comes to the role of producers, I feel like it's their responsibility to support academics. Uh, again, it is difficult to understand what people may need. Um, maybe you are a specialist. Maybe you work in a lot of different crops. Maybe you're brand new. Uh, so how do you figure those things out? Well, in Cooperative Extension, what we do, we have in my opinion, three basic uh, legs to that stool. And the first leg is sometimes you're just present. And like Dr. Rock was talking about uh, earlier, Dr. Sanchez was talking about earlier, it's really important just to listen, just to be present, just to attend conferences like this. But in extension, I really like to, to make site visits and just let people know that I'm available. And what I find is I hear from totally different places these same problems and I'm realizing that these are problems that I need to focus on. Uh, the second piece of that stool, the second leg of that stool, is the advisory board. Uh, I think that's so key. There are people, you know, like we've had so many people talk about already, that are key, that know this industry, that know exactly what they need. Uh, if you have a strong advisory board, they can direct you in which way to go. Sometimes they just advise, but sometimes they're actually the gatekeepers of funding. That's the way we did it up in Washington. We had a, uh, a, a wine advisory board and they had so much funding uh, for every ton of grapes sold there would be a tax paid for every case of wine sold there'd be a tax paid and that money would then uh, go before before researchers and and they would the advisory board would decide who would be funded and the third leg is the needs assessment and that's where I have come to talk to you guys today uh, I am as my first project with the University of Arizona I'm going to be conducting a statewide viticulture needs assessment so you know I don't didn't know what would be going on here in Yuma 
Uh, I, there's probably not too many grape growers out there, but I just wanted to let folks know if you are a grape grower, if you know a grape grower, uh, please feel free to contact me uh, after, after the, the session today or by email. I, I would love to get the feedback of the folks that are working in the wine grape industry and see how we can serve you. Thank you.